So today we're going to be uh, beginning the New Testament. How exciting is that as we focus on Jesus, who is the the beginning of everything, isn't he, in that sense? You know, he is the, the Achiv, you know, he's of first importance in that sense. You know, he is the of most importance. So we're going to be looking at Jesus uh, as the answer to all of the Old Testament problems that have been raised. Um, but Matthew begins... Um, by connecting Jesus back to the Old Testament scriptures and says he is the fulfillment of these things. You know, they're speaking of him, the crucified and the risen one. Okay. And that's important, isn't it? It's important that we realize that the crucified and risen one is the, the wisdom of God, the light of God. You know, he's the the one who all the Old Testament scriptures have been referring to. So I think it's important that we talk about gospel as well. So, you know, Matt, this is the gospel of the good news according to uh, to Matthew. And I think it's important that, you know, the way we use the word gospel uh, in modern usage is probably slightly different from how people uh, in the past used the word gospel. And I think it's just important to be aware of that difference. We think of gospel and we think perhaps, you know, uh, God loves you, you know, you've messed up, Christ died for you, so what are you going to do about it? You know, something like that, the four points, you know. Um, so we think about, you know, gospel presentation or something like that. But for ancient writers, this is the gospel. Um, and it's a proclamation about who Jesus Christ is. Um, and it's, so the content is about who Jesus is um, based on, the Old Testament revelation, isn't it? That he is the one who fulfills Old Testament scripture. So um, Paul might summarize his gospel as, you know, um, you know, First Corinthians 15 reminds you of the good news that I preach you, that Christ died for our sins, that he rose again, uh, that he was seen by many, you know, so it's, you know, it's a reflection on the fact that the one who is crucified and risen is the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. And so when Matthew's saying this is, when we think of Matthew's good news, it's Matthew explaining how the crucified and risen one is the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. Okay, so that's what he's going to do. And that's why it's called a gospel. This is the gospel according to Matthew. OK, um, so you're not going to find when you come to the Gospels um, like an extended reflection on our sinfulness, our need for a saviour and things like that, because that isn't what Matthew's trying to do. He's trying to tell us about the crucified and risen one and give us a message about him, not a message about us. OK, just so we're aware of that. So I think that's important. So he begins his gospel, Matthew 1, verse 1. This is a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. OK, so immediately he wants us to see that uh, the Messiah is from David's family. OK, so we know his ancestors. OK, he's from David's family. He is a descendant of King David. And Matthew's going to present him as a, a new Moses with a better Exodus, uh, who is God with us. He's Emmanuel. He's the image of God in the world who shows us exactly what God is like. OK, so Matthew's going to do all those things. He's wanting to show all those things. So Matthew chapter four, verse 23 says this. Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and sickness among the people. So Jesus preached a gospel, the gospel according to Jesus, as it were. You know, the, the good news that Jesus is preaching is about a kingdom, okay? The gospel of the kingdom. And this must be the very centre of all of our teaching as well, that Jesus is the king of a kingdom. OK, he's talking about the coming rule and reign of God over the cosmos. How through the Messiah, all things are going to be remade. OK, 
And if you want to have a part of that, if you want to transition into the next stage, the age that is to come, then you do so through the Messiah, through him. Like Moses, Jesus is brought up out of Egypt. Instead of crossing the Red Sea, he's baptised in the River Jordan, and he spends 40 days in the wilderness rather than 40 years. And then he ascends to a mountain to proclaim a new law, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, as a fulfilment of the law of Moses. So Jesus often in the Sermon on the Mount will say, you've heard it said, but I say. You know, so he's trying to fulfill, he's trying to expand upon, trying to correct the proper teaching of how it should be understood, etc. But the good news, the gospel, is the good news of the kingdom, of God's rescue operation to confront evil, sickness and death, to restore God's reign over the cosmos and to create a new family, sons and daughters, who are adopted as his heirs in the age to come for himself. OK, so that is the big picture story, isn't it? And so that's what Matthew's trying to talk about. OK, he's trying to talk about that. This is the good news. The good news is about a kingdom that is coming. The Christ, the Messiah is the king. He's the king of this kingdom that is coming. OK, that God has set him over the cosmos okay he's going to reign on god's behalf so the sermon of the mount um makes up the majority of the section that i've given myself today for for matthew's gospel and so i just wanted to read the whole sermon to you because it's the greatest sermon ever written so why not just read it um as the best way so let me read when he saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them by saying, Blessed are, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are you. When people insult you, when they persecute you, and say all kinds of evil things about you, falsely, on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavour, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good... For anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand and give light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see your good deeds and give honour to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish these things, but to fulfil them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter the or stroke of a letter will pass from the law until everything takes place. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven for i tell you unless your righteousness goes beyond that of the experts in the law and the pharisees you will never enter the kingdom of heaven you have heard it said to an older generation do not murder and whoever murders will be subject to judgment but I say to you that anyone who's angry with a brother will be subject to judgment. 
And whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council. Whoever says fool will be sent to the fires of Gehenna. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your gift. Reach agreement quickly with your accuser while on your way to court, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the warden, and you'll be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will never get out there until you have paid the last penny. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to desire her has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better to lose one member than have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. As I say, who, it is said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a legal document. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for immor immor immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard it said to an older generation, do not break an oath, but fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, do not take oaths at all, not by heaven, because it is the throne of God, not by earth, because it is his footstool, not by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, because you're not able to make one hair white or black. Let your words be yes for yes. And no for no. More than this is from the evil one. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. Whoever strikes you on the right tree, turn to him the other as well. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, give him the cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, love your neighbour, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be like your father in heaven. Since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who only love you, what reward will you have? Even tax collectors do the same, don't they? And if you greet your brothers, what more can you do? Even the Gentiles do that, don't they? So then, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or in the streets so that people will praise them. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. But when you do your giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your gift may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on street corners so that people may see them. But truly, I say they have their reward. But whenever you pray, go into the inner room, close the door and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not babble repeatedly, uh, repetitiously like, like the Gentiles do, thinking that because of their many words, they're going to be heard. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need, even before you ask him. So pray this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honoured. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one.
For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look sullen like the hypocrites, for they make faces that are unattractive, so that people will see that they're fasting. But I tell you the truth, they have their reward. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so they will not be other, obvious to others that you're fasting, and only to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not accumulate for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and the devouring insects can destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. But accumulate for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and devouring insects do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is diseased, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then the light in you is darkness. How great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, uh, don't worry about your life, what you eat, or what you drink, or about your body, what you're going to wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. And yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than they are? And which of you, by worrying, can add even an hour to his life? Why do you worry about clothing? Think about how the flowers of the field grow. They do not work or spin. And yes, I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. And if this is how God clothes the wild grass, which is here today and tossed into the fire to heat in the oven, would he clothe you even more, you people of little faith? So then, don't worry saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the unconverted pursue these things, and your Father in heaven knows that you need them. But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. So then do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble on its own. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. For by the standard that you judge, you will be judged. And by the measure you use will be measured you receive. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and yet fail to see the beam of wood in your own? Why do you say to your brother, let me remove that speck from your eye while there is a beam in your own? You hypocrite, first remove the beam from your own eye and then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs or throw pearls before swine. Otherwise they will trample on them and under their feet and turn around and then tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the door will be opened. And if there is anyone among you who, if the son asks for bread, will give them a stone, or if he asks for a fish, would give them a snake. If you then, although you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? In everything, treat others as you would want them to treat you. For this fulfills the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, because the gate is wide and it's spacious that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the way that leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Watch out for false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognise them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorns and figs from thistles, are they? But in the same way, every good tree bears good fruit and bad trees bear 
bad fruit. A good tree is not able to bear bad fruit, nor is a bad tree to bear good fruit. Every tree does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? We cast out demons in your name and do many powerful deeds in your name. And I would declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you lawbreakers. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain fell, the flood came, the winds beat against the house. But it did not collapse because its foundation had been laid upon a rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds beat against the house, it collapsed and it was utterly destroyed. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed by his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not like the experts in the law. That's wonderful, isn't it? It's just wonderful to listen through the Sermon on the Mount, just to hear the words of Jesus as he's sort of saying these things. Um, and you will notice also that I, I use the word Gehenna um, there, uh, which is the word that the Greek uses. Um, some translations might say hell, um, but I just wanted to emphasise the, the point Jesus is making. You know, it's, um, so Gehenna is the um, Valley of Gehinnom. It's the, the valley south of Jerusalem. OK, and it's the rubbish pit where things were thrown in and there was a fire that was burning there that got rid of the rubbish, you know, that kind of. Um, and Jesus is making a point that it's better to cut off a part of your body and throw it than lose your whole body in and be thrown into the valley. You know, it's better to um, get rid of the rubbish in your life rather than you be classed as rubbish to be thrown out. Do you know what I mean? So, um, so I wanted us to have that picture you know that, that that's what he's talking about he's talking about Gehenna um, rather than about some medieval notion of hell okay so I just wanted us to be clear on that as well because um, Jesus isn't a medieval theologian he's you know first century Judean um, in that sense and that's how we understand it okay so he's making references to his own cultural context um, and I think that's helpful for us as well to see it that way. So in conclusion, just as Jesus preached good news about the kingdom that is coming through him, the gospel of the kingdom, that must be so central to our own teaching that he is the king of the kingdom. We have a message to preach about God's rescue, operation to confront evil, to restore his reign, to create this family of sons and daughters for himself who will rule in the age to come. And having heard the teaching of Jesus, we're called to put them into practice, to take up our crosses and follow in his pattern of life, that we might become like him in every way. So Heavenly Father, let us, uh, we just come before you now. We pray that you would be with us, that you would strengthen us, you would delight us, and you would um, direct us towards becoming more and more like Jesus through his teachings and through his pattern of life. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen.